Good afternoon. The seminar is about to begin. We welcome you to Webinar 3, Payment Reform 101 with Suzanne Del Blanco, Mark Gagne, presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation. We hope you enjoy the program and we thank you for joining us today. A PDF copy of today's presentation has been made available to you to print or download. You may access this document by clicking on the Resource tab located on the left side of your screen. You are encouraged to submit questions at any time throughout the broadcast by selecting the Forum tab on the left side of your screen. Simply type your email address in your question and click Send Question. Ms. Delbanco and Mr. Ganya will answer questions at the end of the program, and questions not addressed within our available time may be answered by way of a post-conference email. At this time, I'm happy to introduce Janet Troutwine, NAHU's Executive Vice President and CEO, and NAHU's Education Foundation President. Here's Ms. Troutwine. Thank you. Well, welcome back to our NAHU Education Foundation webinar series on the new healthcare landscape. Um, as a reminder, our series is a 10-part series that goes through the month of November. Today's live webinar and all future webinars in this series are free and they're located on the NAHU Education Foundation's website at www.nahuef.org. If you've missed a few of these uh, series before this, I encourage you to go back and view all of them and please give us your feedback. It's my pleasure to introduce the presenters for today's session. Suzanne Delbanco is the Executive Director of Catalyst for Payment Reform an independent nonprofit corporation working on behalf of large healthcare purchasers to catalyze improvements as to how we pay for healthcare services and to promote better and higher health value in the United States. In addition to her duties at CPR, Suzanne serves on the coordinating committee of the Measures Application Partnership for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute Board, and participates in the Healthcare Executives Leadership Network. Mark Gagne is a co-owner and chief innovation officer of Borslow Insurance located in the greater Boston area. Borslow Insurance is an employee benefits brokerage and consulting firm serving over 350 corporate and 2,000 individual clients and more than 100,000 members in 35 states across the country. Mark has more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry and is a pioneer in the use of consumer-driven health and wellness plans to lower health care costs and improve health and well-being. I'll go ahead and turn it over now to Mark and Suzanne. Thank you so much, Janet, and it's a pleasure to be here again with Mark. And while today's topic is Payment Reform 101, um, don't get too relaxed because there's nothing simple about payment reform. And even though this is sort of like a 101 level lecture, um, I realize I've been working on this topic full time for the last five years and I still learn something new every day. So hopefully all of you will learn something new today too and um, uh, you know, I would look forward to all of your questions because it is a very complex topic. I'm going to try to break it down and make it simple, um, but I'll look forward to your comments and questions as we go on and uh, Mark as your fellow uh, broker will chime in and jump in when he has clarifying questions himself or comments he wants to add. So I'm going to just start by talking about what is payment reform. Um, payment reform is a pretty broad topic, and I think you would get a different definition from you know, each different person that you asked. But I'll start by sharing with you what my perspective on payment reform is and, therefore, what the scope of the rest of the presentation will be about. So Catalyst for Payment Reform defines payment reform as payment that reflects provider performance, especially the quality and safety of care that providers deliver. It also is payment methods that are designed to spur efficiency and reduce unnecessary spending. So you can see the two goals there, that, that payment reform is trying to get at better quality care, and it's also trying to make care more affordable. So those are really the two simultaneous goals that we think payment reform should try to achieve. But in our view, if a payment method only addresses efficiency or the cost side of the equation, we don't really consider that to be payment reform because we want to make sure that the quality of care is also protected and, if, if, uh, um, if possible, made better as a result of changing how we pay doctors and hospitals. So that's our perspective on payment reform. You will see other perspectives, again, maybe with less emphasis on the quality side, but in our view, if you want to get better value for healthcare spending, 
you've got to include the quality side of the equation there. So, Suzanne, when you're talking when you're talking about efficiency, you're really talking about cost. Is that correct? Is that the translation we would use? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination. So, okay. there's different ways to try to measure a reduction in cost. It could be a reduction in utilization or a reduction mm -hmm. in the delivery of care that's thought to be unnecessary. And it could it could be that literally. Um, there are less expenditures because there's a new negotiated rate because you're changing the method of payment, and as part of that, you got a better rate. Great. It's really a combination of lots of things, but efficiency is a big piece of it because part of what we're trying to do with payment reform is make sure that patients are getting the right care in the right way at the right time, in the right setting, et cetera, and um, there's a lot of efficiencies uh, that come out of that, and that's really what we're pointing to there. Great. Thank you. No, thanks for the question. So, you know, when we got started about five years ago as an organization, and our goal was to try to provide, you know, thought leadership to and coordination among big purchasers of healthcare, we realized that most people just did not have a vocabulary for talking about payment reform and the spectrum of reforms that are out there. So we created this framework that you see here on your screen which really shows, in some, in some people's minds, the evolution of payment methods. In other people's minds, it shows the spectrum of payment methods that we'll probably be living with for a long time. So one of the most popular things today to say is that we got to move away from fee-for-service, which is sort of the a la carte version of payment, where you pay for every individual service, test, diagnosis, procedure, visit, et cetera, and there's no sort of fixed price menu. It's really just everything a la carte. Some people think that payment reform means getting rid of that and moving toward greater and greater packaging of payment where you might pay one price to take care of an entire episode of care, like a hip replacement or a pregnancy and delivery. And then some people think it needs to move even further where we pay a set amount per patient per year for everything that patient needs. And so as you look at this table here and you move from left to right, you have increasing accountability on the part of the provider, both financially and sometimes in terms of quality, and I'll get at that in a minute. You have more and more financial risk being taken uh, by the provider. It also requires more and more collaboration across providers to pull off moving from left to right. And you'll also see more complexity occurring as a result and also resistance on the part of providers. There's a reason why we have so much fee-for-service payment in this country. It's simpler. Um, it's something that everyone's used to. And there are plenty of providers who are doing quite well under a fee-for-service model and really have no desire to change. Um, one thing I will say about all of these models is they all have their incentives and their perverse incentives, you know, the positive and the negative. Um, on the fee-for-service end, you know, there tends to be a desire to provide more care and more expensive care because that's how a provider generates revenue. Uh, all the way at the other end of the spectrum, capitation or global payment, whatever you choose to call it, um, there's fear that there might be care uh, withheld from patients because providers will make more money if they deliver less care. Um, so all of these payment methods have, you know, sort of a, a good side and a bad side. Um, and so our view is that all of them could be improved and that um, the quality component I talked about is central to our definition of payment reform needs to be applied in every case here. And so if you were to uh, dress up fee-for-service with some kind of quality component and make sure that bundled and global payments have some kind of quality component, then you can start making sure that um, any perverse incentives are not deleterious to the patient's you know, who are on the receiving end of the care. And there's no perfect way to do this. We're still arguing over what quality measures are right. But the bottom line is, is that there are improvements we can make to all these forms of payment. And all of them, when they were born, were born without quality, were born without quality measurement. So we've had bundled payment in the past without concern to quality. We've had capitation in the past without concern to quality. There's very little of that left. But um, the point is, is that... Um, you know, there are ways to improve each of these methods. And our view is that even though people argue right now that we're moving away from fee-for-service, when you look at most of the payment reform methods in use today, they're still resting on a fee-for-service chassis. And I'll get into more detail about that in a moment. So anyway, yeah, quick, the whole framework... Quick, quick, comment, yeah, well, quick comment there about um, technology. 
do you think that technology helps enable any one of these forms of payment, or does it really affect all three uh, buckets of, of payment? What's your perspective on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So by technology, I assume you mean sort of information technology. Yes. Um, and maybe even the electronic health record. So, you know, that affects all three of these. I think it's almost impossible to do bundled payment or global payment on a big scale without technology because in order to track what provider is doing what to each patient, how the patient is faring, what is the provider's financial performance in near real time, um, all that kind of stuff is going to be greatly enabled by, in, you know, the quick exchange of information and the quick calculation of the status of things. I think fee-for-service is easier to do without, you know, the, the technology. Um, but as you move from left to right on this, on this chart here, you're going to want to have a way of keeping track of how the provider is performing, how the patients are faring, because all that ultimately plays into, um, uh, Ha, you know, making sure that the provider can uh, stay financially, you know, solvent under these payment methods, and mm-hmm. also making sure there's no um, harm being brought to patients um, whose care is now being subject to these new set of incentives and, and disincentives. Good question. So um, I'm going to take you now to a different way of looking at things, which is. Um, in the middle here under examples is sort of the laundry list of all the different types of payment reform we're seeing in the marketplace today. And I will get into more detail on on many of these in a moment, so I'm not going to walk through those. But what I'm going to point you to is on the left side where it says type, there are really three major buckets into which most payment reform methods fall right now. And I look at this from the perspective of what the provider experiences. So the most common type of payment reform today are methods of payment where there is some kind of quality measurement or incentive for quality improvement, and if a provider meets certain standards, they stand to gain some kind of upside financially. Now, um, you know, pay for performance is probably the most classic example of this, where a provider might continue to be paid on a fee-for-service basis but if they meet certain quality standards, they will get a bonus check. It could be on a quarterly basis. It could be on a yearly basis. That basically gives them kudos for having uh, performed well according to quality guidelines that were set for them. Um, now, it's not entirely true that it's only an upside in the sense that there are insurers out there negotiating with providers in some cases to say, I'm not going to increase your fee schedule this year. But if you want an increase, the way you earn that is by meeting certain quality targets or efficiency targets. So, um, but the bottom line is, is that there isn't really a risk that's unknown for the provider that might lead to less income than they're expecting. Um, in the middle, uh, the white row, you see where it says downside only for providers. So there are some pay- uh, payment methods that have been brought onto the scene where if the provider does not perform well, they stand to lose money. There's no upside, there's just a downside. And a great example of that would be uh, how the federal government for the Medicare program has stopped elevating payments for, uh, for patients who acquire um, healthcare-acquired infections during the course of medical care. In the past, um, it was no big deal. The hospital would just get paid more uh, for taking care of those complications. Now, if, if it's clear that those infections were acquired during the hospital stay, as an example, Um, CMS no longer elevates the payment for that hospital to cover the cost of caring for that infection. Another example would be early elective deliveries. Um, There have been um, some examples of uh, payers saying that they will no longer pay when a woman wants to have uh, an elective birth take place, let's say, between 37 and 39 weeks, you know, pre-full term and there's no medical necessity behind that, um, then some payers say they just won't pay for it. And, uh, and, and therefore, if a provider performs an early elective delivery, there will be no reimbursement. And then the third category, which is the most rare today, is two-sided risk, where it's some combination of upside and downside. And I would say that bundled payment and capitation and global payment fall into that uh, category, as does some of the more sophisticated arrangements we're seeing around accountable care organizations. So this is where a provider could stand to make more 
but if they overspend some kind of budget or agree to price um, or um, target for spending, they eat the cost. So um, these are really the three buckets that almost every example we've seen falls into. And in my mind, at least, that helps me understand the range of what's out there. And you'll hear people say that healthcare providers today, for the most part, are not ready to take on financial risk. You know, they're not insurance companies. They don't have actuaries on staff to help them figure out what that insurance risk is. And therefore, let's start with only carrots and no sticks. Um, many contracts are being negotiated now, especially for accountable care organizations, that create a glide path from moving from upside only to shared risk over time, um, with the idea being that as, as, as the provider gets used to being held to account for the spending as well as the quality, um, they will be more and more ready to take on that risk. Um, so those are the two sort of framing um, methods that I have for helping you understand the payment reforms that are out there. And now what I'm going to do is um, let you know where things stand in the nation today in terms of the methods that have been adopted. And then we'll go into some detail on the specific ones. So my organization, Catalyst for Payment Reform, for the last two years in a row, in, in 2013 and 2014, put out a national scorecard on payment reform. And this was a, um, an attempt to really track the nation's progress on payment reform, um, especially because CPR had set a goal that by the year 2020, we want to see at least 20% of payments flowing through methods that are proven to improve value. And so if that's our goal, we better start tracking it and see, see how we're doing. Um, so we did a national survey of commercial health plans and asked them to tell us out of all the dollars they're spending on doctors and hospitals, what methods of payment are they using for each? And so through that uh, survey, we were able to figure out that in 2013, so our scorecard came out in 2014, but 2013 data showed that 40% of payments in the commercial marketplace in network met our definition of payment form or, or were value-oriented. That's another adjective we tend to use. Um, so um, if you want to take a closer look at the scorecard, you can find it on our website. Um, but essentially, those drops on the right side that are falling into the beaker represent the different payment methods that are in use. And you can see, um, you know, the biggest drop at the bottom there is full capitation. We've got a lot of fee-for-service-based fee for pay for performance. And then as you kind of go up towards the top, the drops get very small, including bundled payment, about which there's lots of discussion, but there's really only, you know, um, about 1%, uh, less than 1% of um, payments flowing through that method right now. So it's, a, it's sort of a topic that's talked about with great aspiration, but not a lot of implementation yet. And out of all these payment reform uh, uh, payments in place, just slightly more than half put the, um, the provider at some risk. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, again, a trajectory that I think we're on, but it's moving slowly. And we also found that hospitals have more experience with payment reform than outpatient physicians, and that right now uh, primary care physicians have much more experience with payment reform than specialists. And I think that's in large part because of the movement around patient-centered medical homes and some of the new payment methods that are supporting that uh, new mode of delivering primary care. So, Suzanne, uh, when I take a look at your national scorecard, I obviously see that cost and quality of care are two of the metrics you're using to measure overall value. Where is your thinking uh, relative to the consumer experience? Um, is that part of your thinking relative to the national scorecards, or is it just squarely on cost and quality for the time being? Well, when you say the consumer experience, the one thing that we do measure in the scorecard is how much reach there is to mm -hmm. patients payment reform mm -hmm. right now. How many, how many patients care is probably looking different today because of the way their providers are being paid. And we had a national advisory committee help us create the domains and metrics for this scorecard, you know, sort of a Noah's Ark approach where we had health plans, providers, and everybody around the table. And because everyone was very concerned that each health plan report things the same way, we actually used a very strict definition of member reach uh, or patient member reach, which was attribution. So these are... Um, healthcare delivery models in which patients are really, you know, known to be um, mostly getting their care from a particular provider, and therefore they're essentially assigned to that provider as their responsibility in terms of quality and cost. 
So um, using a very strict definition of attribution, which mostly pertains to patients who are getting care through a patient-centered medical home or an ACO, accountable care organization, um, we, we did track that. Um, it's a very conservative measure because clearly far more people might have doctors who are getting pay for performance bonuses or things like that. But yeah, and the reason really- I the, and the reason I ask is because I understand Medicare with hospitals, as an example, withholds ten percent, and that ten percent of the reimbursement is directly attributable to the member satisfaction, if you will, relative to that experience they've had with that hospital. So that's why I asked the question. Oh, got, so now, now that I understand your question better, what I will say is that. I think patient um, satisfaction and experience of care measures are quite prevalent these days where they can be used. And so in many cases, um, the payments here that we're counting as payment form, we're probably including those measures along with other clinical quality measures and process measures. So I think that's reflected here in terms of our, um, you know, what we consider to be payment form. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, So now that you have a sense of where the nation stands, so and and I should give a little bit of a backdrop here because when CPR got started in 2010, we put out a very informal um, set of questions via email to some of the nation's biggest health plans and said, can you just tell us, give us a a ballpark of where you are right now in terms of what proportion of your payments uh, to doctors and hospitals are tied to performance? And at the time, it was between 1% and 3%. And when we put out our scorecard in 2013, the first ever national scorecard on payment reform, there were only about 11% of of dollars flowing through methods that we considered to be value-oriented or or meet our definition of payment reform. So the fact that in our 2014 scorecard, we had jumped to 40% gives you a feel for the flurry of activity and experimentation that's happening. Mm. And I will point out that this scorecard does not measure the impact of payment reform. We don't know yet what methods work best in what context. We don't really know for sure that all this effort is going to lead us to better quality care and more affordable care. We're obviously hoping, um, and experimentation is critical here, but it's too early to to say for sure where that stands, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to walk you through right now. So just to kind of cover some of the most common payment reform strategies, I'm going to walk through them one at a time. I'll define them, I'll give some examples, and I'll talk about what results are known. Um, Let's start with the one that seems to be both the most common and also growing the fastest. We found the biggest jump uh, between our 2013 and 2014 scorecards in pay for for performance. And it was a little bit head-scratching because, as I'll share in a moment, the evidence for pay for performance improving quality is is there. It's it's not um, mind-blowing, but it's there. Um, but there's virtually no evidence that pay for performance helps contain costs at all. And the fact that health plans are investing in this more heavily than anything else right now, I think is really more an indication that this is something that everybody's figured out how to do. It's become accepted, and it's much easier to grow existing pay for performance programs than to figure out how to do some of those more complex types of payment reform that, you know, on that first framework slide, you know, you have to move to the right to get to, like the bundled payment or the global payment. So pay for performance is is really you you continue to pay providers the way you normally do, but then on top of that, you provide some kind of financial incentive to achieve improved performance by increasing the quality of care and or reducing costs. I think nine and a half times out of 10 pay for performance programs really focus on quality, not so much on costs. And I think that's part of why they haven't had much of an impact on costs. Going back to the comment you made made earlier relative to uh, the chassis that we're working with most commonly used to reimburse uh, providers, it's on a fee-for-service basis. So do you think that this is being adopted as rapidly as it's being adopted because of that chassis? I think it's part of it, but you'll see in a moment that almost every other payment reform method being used right now is also on that chassis. So um, I think it's just, you know, uh, you know, the first pay for performance program uh, of any note really came out in, two, in 2001. So we've had 14 years of experience. Um, I remember in the early days of pay for performance, we had examples of doctors throwing checks away because they didn't know what they were for. You know, it was, it was, it was very new, but we're in a different era now where everyone kind of knows what this is all about. Um, I really think the growth is partly, uh, it's partly because of fee for service chassis, but it's also just because people have gotten their feet wet here. They feel confident about it. It's, it's easier just to add five more measures than it is to start something new. Mm. Great. Um, 
so I, I've defined paper performance for you. I think in a good example of paper performance, and one of the longest standing ones, is um, uh, was started by an organization, a nonprofit called Bridges to Excellence. And in full disclosure, I have been on the board of Bridges to Excellence for a very long time. Um, it's a small nonprofit that's now um, been subsumed by another nonprofit called the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute. Um, because they also started another program that they decided to merge together with this one. Um, And it's essentially a very rigorous program of evaluating the quality of provider care for specific conditions and disease states. And then um, those uh, aspects of performance become the basis for bonus payments. And this program has been licensed by major uh, national health plans, and uh, has been in play for quite a long time. And what's nice about it is that there are, um, there's recognition for the physician that can be integrated into a consumer-facing transparency. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, the basis for some kind of change in the payment mechanism. So they've got, I've lost track of how many categories, but they started out with some of the obvious areas like diabetes care, asthma care, um, and uh, really before the concept of patient-centered medical home, they had something called physician practice connections where they were looking at the management of the patient across the healthcare system and things like that. So there's a variety of categories. And what's also really fascinating about it is there's a component where physicians have to review their own medical records and document whether they're following guidelines. So there's sort of a Hawthorne effect that takes place as as physicians get insight into what they're doing. Um, And there is some evidence that physicians who are recognized by Bridges to Excellence in some category also tend to be more efficient and less expensive. And that's because they're following guidelines. They're getting things right the first time. Um, So it's been, you know, a longstanding, pretty successful program. And um, there is some evidence around... um, uh, the results beyond Bridges to Excellence. Um, For example, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Physician Group Practice Demonstration showed improved clinical management of diabetes also and had lower Medicare spending growth rates um, than their peers in their market. So, again, I think, you know, it focuses people's attention. Um, As I said, if you looked across all of the published studies, you would find that it had more of an impact on quality than cost, but it has had some impact on cost in some cases. Um, so the other thing I was going to say is, you know, as pay for performance are growing, programs are growing right now, I think they're growing really frankly more in terms of the breadth of measures, um, and aspects of performance that are being measured rather than the size of the bonus. And one of the problems with pay for performance historically has been that the size of the bonus is so small that, you know, it really takes a lot of effort to get physicians to focus on the areas you want to improve. It, it can't necessarily be based just on a financial motivation um, because, uh, you know, most of these uh, what I, bonuses would be what I call kind of wimpy. Um, but over time, I think we have to keep experimenting and figure out how big a bonus needs to be to really get a physician's attention. So, Suzanne, how do, how do bonus payments on top of fee-for-service help move us towards value? Well, I mean, just the fact that fee-for-service in and of itself does not – pay any attention to quality. Doctors and hospitals get paid regardless of whether care was good, bad, free of mistakes, full of mistakes, needed, unneeded. And so the quality component of it starts focusing their attention more on whether or not the care they're delivering is what the patient needs. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a big step in the right direction. Great. Thank you. So one of the other things that's wrong with fee-for-service, other than, you know, the fact that it encourages people to deliver more and more expensive care, is that it also often doesn't pay for things that we know would be really beneficial to patients. And one example of that is, um, you know, coordinating their care. So if you are a patient, you've got a primary care doctor, and let's say you've got two or three different conditions, and you have to go to specialists for those. Um, wouldn't it be nice if there was someone who's paying attention to the whole picture and making sure that there's not redundancy in tests you get and that your medicines aren't conflicting and all that stuff, um, or even helping you with some, you know, get ancillary services that you might need. And historically, physicians, uh, especially primary care physicians, have not been paid to play that function. And instead, you know, I grew up, I'll, you know, just to 
share a personal story. You know, my dad uh, is a primary care, care physician. He's not practicing anymore, but he just stopped a few years ago. But I grew up every night with him calling patients, checking in on things, calling their specialists, checking stuff. That was stuff he never got paid for. Now, for my dad, it was, you know, he was completely passionate about his work. He never once complained about that. But you can imagine that for some people, if you're not going to get paid for that, how are you going to make time in your day because you're, you're churning out the patient visits in order to generate your revenue, and you don't have the money to hire a case manager to embed in your office. And so the latest thinking here is that we need to pay some kind of care coordination fee to primary care physicians so that they can re-engineer how they're providing care and pay attention to that care coordination. And so um, another common payment reform that we're seeing are these fees paid to primary care practices, enabling them to get better HIT systems, health information technology systems, and have a case manager on site and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, one example would be that there are payments um, for adopting and using in a meaningful way health information technology, and that's true both in the private sector and from the Medicare program. And then, as I mentioned, these care coordination fees that are paid um, to physicians who are serving as medical homes where they really agreed to try to change the way they deliver care to uh, coordinate everything that their patients need. Suzanne, as I was listening to tell your story about the about your father, it's interesting. I grew up with a dad who wasn't a doctor; he was a physical therapist. But um, same same type of challenges. I would argue they do get paid for making those calls. It's called taking care of the people that are seeing them as patients. Um, I, and I couldn't help but draw the you know draw the reference over to what we do uh, as brokers and consultants with our clients. Um, there are many things that we don't get, quote-unquote, paid for, but it's all about taking care of the individual or the employer uh, that we're working with. So it's interesting you're drawing a distinction about your dad not being paid for looking after the people who he was treating. Yes, it's, a, it's a, something he did after hours, but at the end of the day, it's all about taking care of those individuals, right? So I just want yeah, to I mean, make that, that quick reference. Yeah, that's <laughs> clearly how he viewed it, but... Mm -hmm. the the problem with so many primary care practices across this country is that they're barely keeping afloat, mm -hmm. and the way they can generate revenue to make the business viable is to churn the patients through, but not really to pay enough attention to them and enough time with them, especially for complex patients. So something had to change, and I think what the thinking is around these care coordination fees is not, you know, lots of people have that attitude. Why should we be paying you for something that you should be doing anyway? Um, but it wasn't happening, and so mm -hmm. how do you spark a change? How do you spark um, a primary care practice to invest in new ways of doing things that are ultimately going to benefit the patient and, frankly, make primary care physicians much happier in their jobs, which has been another big issue. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think it was probably a necessary um, and maybe temporary uh, spark that needed to, you know, to happen. Um, Obviously, you can imagine my members who are big purchasers are not that happy about paying anything additional. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, we have to experiment until we figure out how to get it right, and we certainly didn't have it right. Yeah, and the reason, again, I was bringing that up is, you know, if we look at the Affordable Care Act, there's requirements for the medical loss ratio and in insurance carriers and how much, you know, they, they're operating from a premium dollar. You know, 85 cents of it going to health care, 15 cents of it going to administration. Wouldn't it be a wonderful idea if we could hold providers accountable to the same same type of standard? Yeah, it mm. certainly would. Just throwing it out there for thought. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of accountability we could improve on. Yes, totally um, Yeah. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, making – what we have this funny name for these kind of payments. They're not fee-for-service, and they're not visit payments. Um, so fee for service is usually, you know, you do something, I pay you for it. Um, payments for visits are, I think, self-explanatory. So these payments that get made to providers sort of per patient that's in, on their, um, you know, roster uh, is just a sort of different category. And there have been some very positive results in a Geisinger um, experiment with patient-centered medical homes. They had a 7% net savings. And most of this was through a reduction in hospital admissions. And then at uh, another early experiment at the Department of Defense at uh, Hill Air Force Base in Utah um, looked specifically at the impact of patient-centered medical homes on care for patients with diabetes. And through improving blood sugar control, they were able to save $300,000 per year. And so these are just examples of where investing in that care coordination 
um, really has made a difference in overall costs, not to mention patient suffering and harm. So, um, you know, I, I am not, I don't feel like I've drunk the Kool-Aid when it comes to these mm. care coordination fees, but I, I do think that there is some evidence that they have made, uh, you know, a positive impact. Um, but what was interesting is that a systematic review came out not that long ago and showed that while quality measures did get better, um, the, the patient-centered medical homes that had the highest level ratings from the NCQA, the National Committee on Quality Assurance, did not necessarily produce savings. Um, so at the end of the day, um, you know, we're looking for those um, sort of uh, silver bullets that help us on the quality side and on the cost side. Um, but, you know, it's early days. I think there's still stuff to be learned here. Um, and uh, again, you know, we just think it's an era where we need to experiment boldly and also evaluate. And this is an example of where a big evaluation showed some important findings that people are going to need to, you know, uh, ponder and figure out how to um, then turn around into action. Um, so another method that has been around for quite a while, and I live in California where capitation is among the most prevalent in the country as well as, uh, I think that's true in Minnesota too, um, and even in Massachusetts where Mark lives, I think there's probably more than there is in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, full capitation with quality is what we consider to be a fixed dollar payment to providers for the care that patients might get in a certain time period. Um, and there are typically adjustments for the severity of illness of that patient population, um, and there are typically adjustments for the quality of care. As I said, historically, there were plenty of capitated payments made without any quality components, but they're hard to find now. Um, and uh, it, it's essentially a capitation payment with a paper performance component, and that's um, what we're seeing where this is in place. And... Um, you know, there have been some examples um, uh, beyond Minnesota and California, but for the most part, that's where we're seeing it. And in Minnesota, the Senior Health Options Program provided capitated payment for seniors that were in both Medicare and Medicaid, and they had a value-based component to the payment, you know, on certain quality measures. And um, the results there, you know, meant that uh, patients had greater access to care. They had fewer preventable hospitalizations fewer nursing home admissions, which is obviously very relevant in the older population. And uh, nicely, the beneficiaries felt very satisfied with the program and with their providers. So uh, again, another example of where um, this can you know, help in terms of quality and also satisfaction, but the evidence overall is um, you know, more solid in, the, in, this, in, in this case although it's extremely hard to convince providers who have not historically taken capitated payments to start doing so now. And I think that's the big challenge with this one. We have seen a little bit of growth in capitation, but not nearly as much growth as, as we've seen in pay for performance. Yeah, and the other side of this argument, too, which I, I constantly make is, how, where is the consumer in all of this? Because a fixed fee has no impact on the consumer's choice of where they go get care. It certainly impacts the provider's choice in terms of the services they deploy uh, with that individual, but but I think it lacks consumer focus. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. I think um, historically, you know, Americans have really hated having their choices restricted, mm -hmm. and we're seeing now, um, you know, with the new benefit designs and cost sharing, are that consumers are more willing to make trade offs than they've been in the past, and so. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see over time if people do get more comfortable with greater limitations on the choice of provider in, in exchange for lower premiums or lower cost sharing. And mm. you know, right now we're seeing some evidence of that, but, you know, it's still early days. So moving on to something that um, is like a baby version of capitation, you know, bundled payment, also known as episode-based payment, means a single payment to providers or healthcare facilities, or sometimes, you know, jointly to both, for all the services that a patient needs for a procedure or to treat a given condition. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of discrete examples are easiest to get your head around, like, I need a hip replaced. And so let's package together all the services I need from, you know, my initial evaluation all the way through physical therapy. Um, and let's set a single package price 
Uh, the providers know what they're going to get paid for it. They have to work with each other to make sure that my care goes seamlessly and smoothly and, you know, leads to good outcomes. And I, the patient, especially if I'm subject to cost sharing or, you know, care or sensitive at all to price, you know, will nicely get a complete um, estimate of what my care will cost, which is a lot easier to do with a bundled payment than in a fee-for-service environment. And I think the important thing to note here, and, and I should have mentioned also on the capitation example a moment ago, is that here, you know, providers are assuming financial risk because they're given a set amount to take care of a patient for a given need. And if they exceed that amount, they end up eating the cost. And so um, this is meant to try to create some incentive for the provider to not be wasteful and to, you know, use resources as efficiently as possible. Of the forms that you've mentioned so far, I think, you know, personally, this one holds a lot of promise. I look at this like uh, if I could just cross over to another area of our lives, an all-inclusive vacation. Uh, you know, you can do the a la carte vacation or you can do the all-inclusive. This is, uh, you know, pay one rate, get an experience. There's actually a, a few organizations I know of, but uh, the uh, Oklahoma Oklahoma Surgery Center is a great example of that. They give you a all-in price for everything from the radiologist to the pathologist to the anesthesiologist to the surgeon to the facility fee. It's all in. Here's the number that you pay, and they post it before you even go in and get the surgery. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise with bundled. And, you know, the idea of also creating a warranty attached to that so that mm -hmm. something later, you know, you can come back in. Has left the conference. Mark, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I just heard some kind of interruption. I, I did, too. Um, Okay, hopefully we're still live. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, that, that's an example um, of what Geisinger did very early on with its proven care model. Um, and they've extended proven care to many, many things, but they started, they started with a, a heart bypass surgery and um, basically said, here's the price, you come in, if something goes wrong, we will eat the cost, we will take care of you, you will not have to pay anything additional. And so it really creates um, very focused attention on the part of the provider to make sure all their processes are in place, you know, they're coordinated with the ancillary services, um, everything goes seamlessly for the patient. And so I do think that, you know, many, many people think there's a lot of promise here. I think the challenge with bundled payment is that it's extremely complicated to implement. Um, and, you know, the results have been very positive, both in terms of quality and cost. Um, here is an example from proven care for the um, coronary artery bypass graft surgery. You know, data showed improved health outcomes, lower readmissions, and a savings of 6%, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, but as I have, you know, painstakingly been involved in trying to get bundled payment off the ground and more experimentation with it, um, you know, there is not a single national insurance carrier today that can automate bundled payments. They are all processing the claims manually. They're, they're doing a sort of rep retrospective reconciliation as opposed to making a prospective bundled payment. I think that will simplify things when they're able to do that. But right now, what they're essentially doing is continuing to pay on a fee-for-service basis, pulling all the claims together. They've agreed in the past, you know, prior to what the bundled price should be. And then they do a reconciliation. And so, you know, as long as it's going to take, you know, that kind of manual processing, it's not going to go to scale. And um, and that's really where I think the holdup is right now. Pretty amazing in today's 2015 technology that they're having that much trouble. Is it because they're trying to, you know, reformat what they currently have, to your point before, about having a certain chassis in place, uh, rather than starting over from scratch and saying, okay, this is the way we're going to design it? Yeah, I mean, everyone, and maybe understandably, likes to ramp up to, to big changes. And so sure. the way that people typically start is they say, well, we'll just keep paying you the same way, but we're going to start tracking what you actually spend. We're going to have an agreed-upon budget, and then we'll figure out later if you met. Has joined the conference. When, they, when they're getting better at figuring out what the negotiated payment should be, um, mm -hmm. then uh, I think we'll see much more prospective bundled payment. And I think that's really when things will um, be felt more acutely by providers because they'll get that check in the beginning and this is all you have, you know, to take care of the patient. Um, and I think administratively it will be much simpler. So um, I think it's, you know, just, early early stage and people are afraid to kind of jump there in case they really mess up 
you know, what the amount should be. And Mark, I heard another interruption, so I want to make sure you're still there. Yes, I am. We're good. Good. <laughs> and I, um, checked with, I checked with Jennifer. We're good uh, all, all the way around, so we're in good shape. Good. Yep. Um, so um, I know we're sort of moving here quickly. I just know that there are going to be a lot of questions, so I want to, um, you know, make I've got sure. About 10, I've got about 10 in the queue so far, so you're okay. right. So yeah. I'm going to keep sailing along, and then we'll have time to answer people's questions and get into the details that people want to. Um, so, so the next payment method I was going to talk about is shared savings. And um, you know, if we go back to my comment about how most payment reforms today are still based on fee-for-service, this is a great example. And the basic idea here is, uh, just like we were kind of talking about with a bundle payment, how you just kind of keep paying doctors as normal with uh, fee-for-service, the difference is, is that you, you know, based on prior year spending or prior years in some cases, you come up with what you expect the spending to be in the coming year, and you agree on a essentially a target that might be, let's say, 2% less than the trend that is expected. It may not be 2% less than last year, but it's 2% less than maybe what the trend is expected to be. And you say to the providers who are subject to this payment arrangement that if you are able to meet or even beat that 2% saving, we will share in the savings with you. You'll get 50%, we'll get 50%. So it's kind of like I was saying before that some of these upside-only types of payment reforms, uh, it's not like they're going to get richer than they were last year. It's They're subject to new requirements where if they would essentially want to earn back what they would have made in the prior year, they have to do so in part by spending less and in part by meeting quality targets. So, um, you know, strictly the definition for shared savings arrangements are, you know, is that it provides an incentive for providers or provider entities to reduce unnecessary healthcare spending for a defined population of patients or for an episode of care by offering providers a percentage of any realized net savings. And savings, like I said, can be measured as the difference between expected and actual cost in a given, me a given measurement year. And shared savings programs can be based on fee-for-service. And you, you'll find some examples where there might be an arrangement made that's three years long, and in the first year, it's let's be trend. In the next year, it's let's, um, you know, be neutral from where we were last year. And then in the third year, let's be at spending levels from, you know, two years ago. So you'll see this, you know, the sort of screws tighten and there will be an expectation for greater and greater savings over time. And these models have been applied both in, um, in actually several different settings. You'll hear about them commonly in the accountable care organization movement. We're also hearing more and more about patient-centered medical homes also having a shared savings component in addition to that care coordination fee. Um, and then in this example of the intensive outpatient care model um, that several large employers and other big purchasers have used for very complex patients um, who are high utilizers and high spenders, they've come up with um, a change in how that patient's care is delivered with a lot of case management and an agreement to, with all those patients' providers that if they can reduce spending compared to the past, they will get to share in some of the savings. And so you can imagine someone who has, you know, three or four complex conditions, um, maybe doesn't have a solid um, uh, uh, housing situation. Um, they end up in the emergency room quite a lot. And uh, everyone recognizes that with some intense care coordination, getting that person everything from maybe more solid housing to meals, to having their clinical care taken care of, that we can keep that patient out of the emergency room, you know, uh, in a big way. And that means better things for the patient, and it means better things for healthcare expenditures. So um, there have been several experimentations with this model with a shared savings component, and Boeing published some of its results and found that it not only improved health outcomes, but it also has saved them 20%. So we're seeing more people replicate that model. Not in every case has it saved as much as that, um, but that's another example of where uh, shared savings has come into play. So Suzanne, with the shared savings, if you look at that model really quickly, obviously with a large self-funded employer uh, like Boeing, they can pass on uh, those savings uh, to their 
you know, to their employees who they're covering and their dependents because their, uh, their medical costs dictate the price that they pay uh, for the cost of insurance that they have. But when you're talking in the fully insured market, you know, perhaps these shared savings are being directed towards the wrong parties. One of the questions being asked, and I just wanted to ask it while we're here, is shouldn't these savings go towards paying premiums uh, in that market? Yeah, I think that's a great question and a tricky one. Um, and I say tricky not because I think it would be complicated to administer, but you know, the question is who needs the incentive the most right now? Um, mm-hmm. And if we are ever going to get providers to change the way they're delivering care, do we need to focus there or do we need to focus with the patient? And um, I think, honestly, you can do both. And one of the things that we're really focused on at CPR is the importance of aligning benefit design with payment reform. So mm-hmm. this is a perfect example of that where um, you could imagine anything from you know, value-based insurance design, which I know there's going to be a webinar on soon, um, where you basically waive the cost sharing for certain key services that a very complicated patient would really do better if they, if they were to seek. Um, in combination with a shared savings program for the provider. And the provider might feel a lot better about it because they know that the patient has an incentive to take care of themselves that they didn't have in the past. Mm. So I think, I think thinking about how benefit design and payment reform can complement each other. You know, you, you talked about another nice analogy, vacation packages. I'll give one here, you know, wine and cheese pairings. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, I think we will um, have much better results than if we only think about one side or the other. Thank you. Um, So I guess the cousin to shared savings is shared risk. Most shared risk payment arrangements include shared savings on one side. And then on the other side, basically say to the provider that if you overspend, you will eat those costs. And you, know, you guys are all really good um, at you know, sort of actuarial concepts and things like that. You know, there are risk corridors set up. It's not ever as simple as, you know, you will you know, have to suffer the depths of your, of your overspending. Sometimes there are, you know, um, caps put on that and things. But the basic idea with shared risk is that the provider is accepting uh, some financial liability when they don't meet specified financial or quality targets. And that could include a loss of a bonus. It, it could include, you know, really baseline revenue loss um, and, uh, you know, loss for the costs that exceed whatever the budget is that was set as expressed in the global or capitation payment or, or, um, uh, or whatnot. And it could also include withholds um, that are retained to uh, adjusted fee schedules. So sometimes, um, you know, what the insurance, carrier might say is, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, you know, agree to this fee schedule, but if you, uh, but I'm not going to give it all to you at once. If you don't meet certain targets, you're not going to get made whole by the payment that would come if you did. So, um, you know, shared risk is, in many cases, what people think will be the most potent form of payment Mm -hmm. reform, Mm -hmm. where it will create the strongest incentive for providers to really focus on quality and really focus on reducing their waste of resources. Um, but we see very little of it so far because, uh, you know, providers are kind of warming up to taking on some of that insurance risk that they, in many cases, are not used to handling. Um, one example of shared risk in play is right in my neighborhood, um, in, the, in Northern California, where CalPERS, which is the California Public Employee Retiree System, um, biggest purchaser in the country after Medicare, um, they partnered with uh, Blue Shield of California, Hill Physicians, which is a physician, big physician group, and Dignity Health, which is a health system, to create an accountable care organization, and shared risk was part of the payment arrangement. So the providers stand to lose if they overspent. And the results of the program have been very positive. Um, I've tried to click on the next slide here. Oh, there it goes. Uh, It wasn't showing up on my screen yet. Um, And the results included reduced hospital admissions, reduced readmissions, reduced length of stay in the hospital, um, and $20 million in savings in the first year. I know that those savings have continued to come, um, and that meant a savings of $400 per member per year. So that was an example of where shared risk, I think, um, was appropriate. You know, the organized physician groups here in California 
and the big integrated delivery systems um, have some experience with capitation. This is not a huge stretch for them, um, but yet adding these extra quality components and uh, a spending target did result in more savings than they were producing without it. So what are your thoughts on, if you look at both bundled payment and shared risk, about using both? Can carriers use both bundled payment and shared savings model combined? Yeah, I mean, so I think when it comes to um, bundled payment, the way that the bundle uh, price is set um, is, is usually done in such a way that it's in, in combination, the providers are going to be earning, um, in some cases, a little bit more than they did in the past. Um, but uh, in other cases, it's set up to be a little less. It really just depends on the market and all kinds of complicated factors. Um, I think in some cases, you can combine these things. In some cases, they're already sort of subsumed in the method. So, okay. um, you know, but in the, in the example of patient-centered medical homes, for example, we're seeing a combination of care coordination fees, shared savings, and pay for performance all at once. So it just kind of depends on the method and whether or not it makes sense to throw more than one at a provider or provider group or not. And maybe the, way, maybe the reason I'm, those two are resonating with me is they both have a level of accountability, um, which, you know, is a great thing. Um, anytime there's accountability or pay for performance, it's, uh, you know, usually the right, uh, usually the right formula. Yeah, and, le- and I think the idea is all these payment form methods is that there is accountability. It just gets uh, greater and greater as you move from the fee-for-service-based models to the ones where there's a prospective payment made, and that's it. Um, so I think the last method I was going to comment on here is the concept of non-payment. And I, I mentioned what this was related to at the beginning. I gave the examples of hospital-acquired infections and early elective deliveries. The idea here is that when there's substantial medical evidence stating that a particular service or practice is harmful to a patient and does not contribute to their care in any good way, um, then we should stop paying for that care. And uh, like I said, the most um, well-known examples have been CMS's program to stop paying uh, or making elevated payments in the case of hospital-acquired conditions of various types. And then in South Carolina, as a great example, the Medicaid agency and the state blues plan worked together first on a quality improvement initiative and then finally on on this payment change where they agreed together to stop paying for early elective deliveries. And, uh, you know, together in that state, they cover 85% of the births. So this was, you know, massive change. And we have seen the numbers of early elective deliveries drop precipitously. So, do you, um, do, do you foresee a time when physicians might refuse to treat patients that are, you know, not complying with their uh, their treatment plan, medications, lifestyle choices that result in continued poor health? I mean, as a result of the way they're being paid, can you foresee a time when that might happen? Well, there's always concern, right, that mm-hmm. we're going to have patients cherry picking their patients so that they look yep. good, right. and that's you know that's where the you know poor. Uh, I would say not fully developed science of risk adjustment comes in, mm-hmm. and we account for the severity of patients in a, a it, you know, under the responsibility of a given provider, or provider group, or system. Um, it's not a perfect science. I think that's our current attempt to to deal with that. Um, I I don't know. I don't know what will happen as a result. But I think um, as we change benefit designs and kind of try to correspond. Uh, with some of the incentives the providers are under, I think there will be less concern and argument about that. Um, I think in the past when all the, um, you know, pressure was on the provider and virtually no pressure on the consumer, we had a lot of finger pointing from providers saying, why are you holding me responsible? You know, why don't you focus on the patient? Right. Great. Thank you. Uh Uh-huh. So, you know, I've kind of taken you on a whirlwind tour of the different types (laughs) of methods that are out there, um, the ways to think about them and sort of bucket them in your mind, um, and the fact, I think, that you've gleaned that there really isn't rock-solid evidence yet about which methods work and in what context. Um, we have very promising uh, results that are keeping us on the path and in getting everyone excited about payment reform and, you know, the flurry of activity that I talked about with our national scorecard results, you know, I think is a result of that. Um, but we also have to recognize that every market is different. We are in a mm. big, diverse country. 
And even in, you know, uh, California where I live, the, the San Francisco market could not be more different from Los Angeles. And in Massachusetts where Mark lives, you know, Boston couldn't be more different from Springfield. You know, we have um, different levels of competition in these markets. We have different types of, um, you know, demographics in terms of the patients. We have um, from one state to the next, you know, different regulatory environment. And so there really isn't ever going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and in each market, we have to really think about who's calling the shots in that market and what's going to be viable, you know, under um, the dynamics there and what will ultimately lead to good results as opposed to unintended consequences. And so... It would sure be nice if there was just a simple solution that we will arrive at one day that we just apply everywhere, but I think um, that's probably naive. And so as we look at all these different methods, while one experiment might fail, it might also be because the environment in which it was uh, you know, tried. And so we have to keep trying and trying again and start, you know, start connecting the dots about what methods work on, in, in which environment. Um, so that's something that is a little bit sobering, but I think also eye-opening and important to keep in mind. Suzanne, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, I've lived and worked in three different markets, the Washington, D.C., uh, metropolitan area, Chicago, and also Boston, obviously. And uh, you're right. They are all very, very different. One of the things that I, I have seen as a common thing in each marketplace is you have the big gorilla. You know, here in, uh, uh, here in uh, Boston, it's partners. Uh, down in northern Virginia, it's the Innova system. Out in uh, Chicago, it's Evanston Northwestern. And so I guess my question with all these different payment reform methodologies, and this was actually asked by one of our members, and I think this is the right time to ask the question, uh, do you see uh, payment reform meshing with the record number of hospital mergers and acquisitions potentially developing monopolies within given markets? So the question is, will quality initiatives through payment incentives lose leverage with larger and more powerful providers? I think that is such an important question, and anyone who's followed our work knows that this is a topic we've actually spent a lot of energy on, and I don't want to be too depressing, but what I would say is that <laughs> all of the tweaking that we're doing with payment reforms is kind of like rearranging you know, deck chairs on the Titanic as it's sinking um, in comparison to the impact that provider consolidation may have on affordability. Um, and uh, anyone who wants to get more educated about this topic, we've got some nice uh, short briefs on our website about, um, you know, the need to ensure competition in healthcare markets. And, you know, the provider landscape has been changing at an unprecedented rate. There is vertical and horizontal consolidation, and this is leading to a very different balance of power in, you know, many, many different markets. And so what do you do when there's not that much competition and prices are going up, and which, they, which they do as a matter of course, um, uh, in, in, when there's consolidation. And, you know, uh, so, okay, how are you going to, you know, convince this big gorilla in town to take a new form of payment, much less, you know, charge reasonable rates? So it's, it's a very challenging environment. And we are spending a lot of time this year on helping uh, employers think through ways that they can instill more competition in a market, whether it's a centers of excellence program, whether it's peered or narrow networks, you know, medical tourism kind of benefit, you know, using telehealth to control, you know, overutilization of an overpriced healthcare system. You know, we're, we're trying to help our members and other purchasers think through what do they do in a tough market like that. And so the impact of that consolidation is real. Um, I do think that people have begun to accept that consolidation, you know, is pretty much almost automatically always linked to higher prices and that there is no evidence that consolidation has led to higher quality as of yet. You know, the argument's often made, oh, if providers merge, they can coordinate care better, they'll collaborate with each other more. And in fact, you know, as, as all the evidence has been reviewed historically, there's no evidence that care gets better. In some cases, it can even get worse. And yeah, no, so, our, our attorney general here in Massachusetts did a three years in a row studies of, uh, you know, what is the reason for price escalation or cost escalation. And the number one reason was brand, um, you know, provider brand. Uh, in some cases, uh, the, the vari variation in cost is 600 to 800 uh, percent for the same service with no discernible difference in quality. And that's a real big problem. The unit cost issue is a real big problem. Right, and this is where the importance of transparency connects to payment reform mm -hmm. because our view is that 
the more and more transparency we have and the more we can help people understand the link between quality and price. And in fact, you know, right now there isn't one, but if we can reveal that, then these hospitals that by reputation as opposed to size, you know, are able to charge exorbitant prices, that may go away. Um, the market share issue is another issue, and that's mm-hmm. you know I think that's where where the challenge will remain over time. So it's it's a tough tough issue. Definitely. Um, yeah, but before I turn it over to you, Mark, to just talk about all this from you know from your perspective and you know what what this audience might be thinking about, I just want to say that um, you know just to reiterate the theme I think I've been echoing throughout here, which is that. Um, you know, when we first set our goal in 2010 of 20%, we actually had a different wording. We said by 2020, we want at least 20% of payments tied to value, meaning we wanted them to meet our definition of payment reform. Well, you can see that we have far surpassed that. You know, our scorecard showed we're already at 40%. And the reason why we changed our wording is because we realized we could wake up one day as if in a nightmare still, um, because mm. we, let's say we're at 80% of payments meeting our definition of payment reform, but quality hadn't gotten any better and care hadn't gotten any more affordable. Well, what was all that effort worth? Um, So we tweaked the wording to say 20% of payments proven to improve value by 2020 to really bring everybody's focus to the need for evaluation and for spreading the methods that are shown to work. And so, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, five years or not quite five years to really <laughs> buckle down and, um, you know, take advantage of all this experimentation and learn from it. And so that's really where we want um, people's energy to be as focused as on the experimentation side. Hmm. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you. Just advance the slide here. So what is the takeaway for all of us as brokers, producers, and agents in terms of how we take this back and really have it be meaningful for our clients. And so we're going to try and provide us some insight, some impacts, and some takeaways. I, th- I think the first thing we wanted to share with all of you, and we all, we all already know this, but the language of health insurance is very complicated. And frankly, you know, I've said this a million times, and I'll say it a million and one times, it's complicated because it was designed by the rule makers uh, as opposed to the uh, consumers who actually access the healthcare system. And the reality is our clients don't speak this language. Um, they, they don't live in it. It's not their everyday business. That's why they depend on us to translate this for them. So I think as brokers, producers, and agents, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're educated on these important concepts, um, these important payment concepts, and then we learn the language so that we can teach it uh, to our clients, not necessarily in all the, uh, the nomenclature and all the buzzwords that we like to use in our business, but really distill it down for them in terms of what it means. I think as a broker, producer, and agent, it's incumbent upon us to invest in learning about these different models so that we can speak to the pros and cons. You know, I, I already shared it during this webinar. I have a predisposition to a, to a bundled payment or to a shared service or to a shared pricing model where there's upside and downside, but also, and anybody who knows me would know this, very strongly committed to transparency. And so these things all fit together, and actually we're going to get to a question that actually bring those two together. But I guess the important part here is to, to spend some time really, and by being on this webinar you're doing that, spending some time learning about these different payment models. So when your client asks you, you know, I heard about capitation, what does that mean? I've heard about bundled payment, what does that mean? That you're not looking at them staring blankly and don't know because you've invested a little bit of time. You certainly don't need to be an expert like Suzanne, but certainly uh, be able to talk fluently and is something our clients would depend on us for. Understanding how the system works uh, is important for us to deepen and widen the conversations uh, we're having with our clients. Frankly, they're depending on us uh, to deliver that level of education to them. They don't want a voluminous amount of information. They just like us to kind of hit the high points. Some clients want to go deep, but in generally speaking, they want to understand why their costs are escalating like they are. And I think if you're able to speak uh, about the different ways in which uh, they're paid, that will help us uh, you know, have a more meaningful conversation with our clients. At the end of the day, though, we go back to free market principles, start with transparency, and then we can tackle payment reform to improve quality and lower lower, uh, lower overall healthcare costs. And I know Suzanne's a very passionate, uh, very passionate uh, advocate in that regard as well. So, with the remaining 20 minutes we have, Suzanne, I've got about 15 questions here. And I'm going to try and go through them. Maybe we do a speed round. I'm just kidding, um, but we'll go through and uh, and then see how many of them we could answer. Um, the first is with shared risk slash rewards. How does this work with price transparency efforts if the final price is more or less determined after treatment as opposed to before treatment? 
That is a great question, and this is why you know we've talked about the importance of um, when it comes to consumers understanding prices. You know, bundled payment could be such a, a help. Um, it's also th- this issue is also one for employers. How are they supposed to plan financially when they no longer know, you know, based on past years and negotiated you know fees, uh, what their spending is likely to be? But in fact, they're going to have to wait to see what the provider's performance is like, not just uh, the claims. Um, to figure out exactly how much they're going to end up spending. So it clearly complicates matters. And I think our view is that the key with price transparency with consumers is to help them understand how accurate that estimate that we give them is. And mm-hmm. that, you know, there can be things that happen um, a- along the way, whether it's a complication the patient experiences or, you know, some reconciliation with the provider in the new payment method that means that the price ends up looking a little different. So I think, you know, going back to Mark's theme on transparency, that applies here too. Excellent. Um, Pay for performance bonuses is another question coming in from a member. Pay for performance bonuses may be quote unquote wimpy uh, to use your language, um, but they get paid, you know, really well and should already be doing what they should be doing. The question is, do you believe salary withholds may may be better than bonuses at getting providers' attention? I'm sorry, what was the, it was something withholds, what was the word? Yeah, so salary withholds might be better. Um, Do you believe that salary withholds would be better than bonuses at getting their attention? Yeah, well, I mean, social psychology tells us that people pay much more ten- attention to the negative than to the positive. So I think mm. it probably would. <laughs> mm. And the reason why we haven't gone that direction is because, you know, you're facing a group of physicians, you're trying to get them to agree to some new form of payment, and it's a, it's a lot easier to get them to agree to uh, something that's an upside than something that feels punitive. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, next question here. With frivolous lawsuits leading to multiple tests to protect the doctor's liability, uh, which raises uh, unnecessary costs, how, do, how can we control costs um, by imposing national tort reform? So I guess the question here is, uh, do you believe that there needs to be some form of national tort reform in order to control unnecessary medical spending? Yeah, I mean, this is not an area where I have deep expertise, but there's no question we have to find some kind of you know middle ground from where we are now. You know, I think if you look at the situation of um, obstetrics and gynecology, um, we know that OBs have a perceived, you know, much higher perceived sense of risk um, than even the reality is when it comes to, for example, letting a woman, you know, labor on for a delivery instead of just resorting to the C-section. Um, we, we see all kinds of defensive behavior because of concern about liability that really is unfortunate because it leads to worse care for the patient and, um, unnecessary costs and things like that. So there's no question in my mind we need to have some kind of reform. What that is, I couldn't tell you because I haven't studied it enough. Sure, but as a principle, you agree that tort reform makes sense. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you think on-site clinics, which are actually expanding rather um, rather quickly across the country, on-site clinics or, or even minute clinics, um, you know, um, specialty clinics that are not associated with a hospital system, how do you think on-site clinics and large employers will impact payment reform? Oh, I think it's a great question. We've got several members who've got on-site clinics, and they're grappling with all kinds of issues about how to um, connect the patient care in the on-site clinic with the community uh, providers. Um, so I think, you know, there's lots of reasons why employers decide to have on-site clinics, Um it could be because they want to make things more convenient and they think of it as a benefit. It could be because they want to really be able to control there being evidence-based primary care or good care coordination. There's all kinds of reasons why employers decide to go that route. Um, but what they're finding is that it's very challenging to, from an HIT perspective, health information technology perspective, to connect um, the on-site clinics with you know community physicians and facilities, um, and that there isn't as much insight for their on-site clinics as they would like into where to make referrals and all that sort of stuff. So I think there are a lot of challenges with them that are going to get worked through. Um, and I realize now that I've kind of lost the train of, of the question, but it was, it was <laughs> how, how does it relate to payment reform, right? Um, yes, on-site and clinics I, I and how think, do they impact with payment reform? I don't think we're seeing a lot of payment reform happening in terms of the payment methods to the on-site clinic. I think for the most part, these are salaried uh, you know, physicians or nurses, which is a little, you know, different from the fee-for-service concept. So there's less of a, you know, sort of um, volume incentive on the part of the of the clinics. Um, but I think to the degree that they become 
you know, sort of base home, uh, home base for, um, for patients and we're holding groups of, of providers from the onsite clinic into the community accountable for care, you know, there's going to have to be greater connectivity. So I think it's, it's, it's about how, how do they get in more integrated with um, providers in the community? Yeah, and I think, you know, what we, what we also believe, I mean, again, you grew up with a dad as a doc, I grew up with a dad as a physical therapist, and the, nothing used to frustrate my father more than having to treat somebody who he couldn't help uh, because they shouldn't have been to see him. They should have been somewhere else first. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. sure your dad probably had conversations with you about that, too. So I think making sure we have different settings for people to get the care in the right place at the right time by the right provider is ultimately what we're driving at. Mm-hmm. Um, if we look at uh, reference-based pricing for a minute, how, how does reference-based pricing fit into the models? Proponents say it reduces benefit plan costs because it reviews and pays based on actual costs. Uh, what's, your point of view on any of the, uh, what's your point of view on the upside of reference-based pricing? Well, I mean, I think reference-based pricing is one of many benefit designs that we could put into place that would make uh, consumers more sensitive to the price of things and make them pay more attention to the quality. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talked earlier about the need to pair, you know, our wine and cheese pairings between benefit mm-hmm. designs and forms, I think there's a great pairing, for example, with reference pricing and bundled payment, where if we actually have a package price that really is inclusive, then subjecting a patient to reference pricing <clears throat> feels like it's pretty rock solid relationship because when they see what price providers are charging, <clears throat> it really would represent what the, they would end up paying. There's not going to be any surprises with extra bills coming later that you know weren't included in that price estimate. So I think um, it can very much support uh, and complement uh, some payment reform models. I think the other thing we have to recognize is that for providers to accept new forms of payment that are scary to them, we have to reassure them in some way. And one of those ways is to say, we're going to be steering volume your way. And, you know, reference pricing isn't the only thing that can do that, but there are, you know, there's probably a need to have benefit designs in place that will reward providers who are willing to meet certain quality standards and who are willing to take new forms of payment and, you know, charge affordable prices uh, you know, by by sending them more patients. Yeah, it's interesting. One of our members have developed a solution that he talked about at Capital Conference this year, and he talked about uh, actually having providers bid on services. He's created a platform where they can bid on it, and an eighty thousand dollars service was reduced to sixteen thousand dollars, and and uh, ultimately the quality was a lot better. I don't have the exact specific measurement of that, but quality actually increased because providers who had high quality were bidding on the work and were doing it more efficiently. So reference-based pricing may have the, the, imp- the impact of creating a, a more consumer-centric market. Mm-hmm. That's right. So it could do that. Um, are insurance carrier claims and provider payment systems being built with functionality that enables some of these new outcome-based payment ideas, or is there a deficiency currently in these systems built more fee-for-service? I think you referenced that in the beginning of your talk, saying that we have a fee-for-service chassis. Uh, but do you see new systems being created, or do you see workarounds for existing systems that are already 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 in place? Yeah, I think we're seeing m- many more workarounds than we're seeing new systems. I think mm. I think every everyone knows that it's you know on on the roadmap, and they're going to have to get to new systems. But for the most part, right now, what we're seeing are things that can be done with current systems, and there's lots, like I said, lots of manual processing happening. Um, and everyone's a little loath to invest the millions of dollars it's going to take to redo whatever system they have, and they're kind of waiting and seeing to see which method is going to end up being the one that they focus on or which methods um, before they make a huge investment. And um, I think we're going, to have a, we're going to have difficulty scaling any of these methods until that investment is made. Right, and scaling is also going to be difficult because of the, the disparity or the differences in market, as we were talking about about 15, 20 minutes ago. You know, what works right. here is not, even here in Boston, as opposed to, you know, Worcester, and the, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the state, and the Berkshires are very different, even in your own state. And Massachusetts is relatively small. If you look at a state like California or Texas or Florida, I mean, they're, they're so big. There are so, so many differences uh, by geography. Um, one of the, another question here was, if you play this payment methodology out, then the only result will be a cost-benefit analysis applied to every life. What do you think of a market-based response which would only reimburse medical expenses direct to the insured at a set level? The insurer would not be involved with payment to providers. Interesting question. 
It's a great question. It's a great sort of the- theoretical question. Mm-hmm. I just don't think I don't think it reflects the values of of Americans in the sense that you know as we as we know when we look at the kind of spending that happens in this country around health care um, and the tolerance of the proportion of our GDP that it represents, I think um, you know pe- we live in a country where people think that if you can afford it, you should be able to do everything you need. Um, even extreme measures, we spend, you know, more in the last six months of life than we spend in the rest of uh, patient care. And, you know, I, I just, I, I think it's a great question, a very interesting one, but I, I don't think it reflects where most Americans are in terms of their desire to be able to, um, you know, o- overspend their share if needed. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's a, you could probably talk to the whole class on that thought process, actually. Um, yes. Another question came in, said, I'm a health insurance uh, agent for 30 years. I've seen the introduction of HMOs, PPOs, and insurance carrier, uh, carriers that claim these, that, that, that what they're doing to pay providers will control costs. What we found is they just reduced the rate of increase rather than actually reducing the cost. Won't yeah. the same thing just happen here? It'll reduce the slide, if you will. It'll, it'll reduce the slope as opposed to making the slope go down, uh, which is you know, less costly. So what, do you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think people are sort of underambitious when it comes to all this stuff. Most mm. of these, um, you know, shared savings arrangements or shared risk arrangements are based on beating trend, not based mm-hmm. on doing better than years past. There are some exceptions to that, um, but it's almost like everyone just believes we're on this inevitable train, you know, between the aging population, the um, increase in expensive technologies, they, it's, it's kind of, you know, a little bit of a let's, let's just give up and succumb. But going back to the topic we talked about earlier around provider consolidation mm-hmm. and its impact on price, I think what I try to remind everybody is that price is negotiated. Right. And it's not like some kind of fixed principle in nature. <laughs> right. So, That's true. You know, there is room for reducing our spending purely on price alone. And so it, it's, you know, nothing to do with the inherent cost of delivering care. So, um, I, you know, I just think that we have to keep that in mind um, and try to, you know, embolden ourselves to be more ambitious than a lot of the deals we're seeing negotiated right now. Yeah, and I think if you look at just what is one example, LASIK eye surgery, LASIK eye surgery is not covered by insurance. The rate of increase over the last 10 years has been 18% and quality has gone up, you know, tenfold. Uh, if you look at the same amount of time, the same decade, you're looking at health healthcare costs that have increased over 100. percent You know where people don't actually get to see the cost and the quality metrics. So, do you think there's any correlation there with a fully visible market, a market that's completely transparent to the end user, and then ultimately providers competing? Do you think we could cross over from just LASIK eye surgery to all forms of care? I, I think we could. I think it's not just transparency, though. We know when you just give people information, it doesn't necessarily change behavior. I think there have to be incentives with it. Sure. Sure. No, that makes sense. How do you get providers to buy into these new payment models? Well, I well, talked a simple a little question, bit ago. but a, a simple question, but a big one nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll just say theoretically, you know, I talked to, uh, several times during this uh, presentation about the importance of pairing benefit designs with, with payment reforms. And it's not just because we want to, you know, sort of have all the T's crossed and I's dotted and, you know, neatly line everything up. It's also because, you know, we've got to find ways of convincing providers that it's going to serve their interests. And so mm. um, I think, uh, you know, we have to make sure that if they do well by us, they also do well. And, you know, for any of these arrangements to be sustainable, you know, to let's say you sign a three-year deal with a provider, um, if you want them to sign again in year four, you know, it's going to have to be something that worked for them too. Um, and so the key is trying to figure out what are the principles in that contract and the payment amounts and everything that's going to work for both sides and become a sustainable arrangement. So what if providers don't want to switch away from fee-for-service? Oh, I'm sure there will be some that never do. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, heard, I mean, I've talked to a number of, uh, number of providers. I actually talked to quite a few, and many of them claim if you're not the large systems, you don't have the infrastructure or the capital to spend on the technology but the smaller provider systems don't really have the ability to do that. So is it that the bigger become bigger and that the smaller can't compete because they don't have the resources? Or, you know, what are your thoughts that, about You know, that? that's part of the argument for why mm-hmm. consolidation is happening right now. I mean, I've heard every argument, but sure. um, 
that's part of the argument is that, you know, how are onesie twosie shops or smaller shops going to be able to survive under these new payment regimes and quality measurement requirements and all this stuff. So, gee, we have to join the big guys because, you know, we, we can't figure out how to do it on our own. And, you know, th- there's probably some truth to that. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see how it pans out. Um, will, will the change need to come from top down? In other words, government mandates or insurers dictating plan design, or, or could this come from the bottom up, meaning consumers demanding, you know, more appropriate forms of, of value being delivered to them? Or is it a combination of the two? Well, I mean, I think, you know, today we're, our topic is payment reform. So sure. I don't see consumers clamoring for payment reform because I think most consumers have no idea how their providers are paid in the first place. Sure. Um, so they might be asking for better value, but they don't know what the mechanism might be or they don't know that that should be one of the mechanisms. Um, I also don't see this coming from top down. I mean, there's just as much experimentation in the private sector right now as there is in government. And the only reason there is so much in government is because of, you know, recent laws that were passed. It was not necessarily true, uh, you know, five, six years ago. So, um, and, and we're seeing, you know, unprecedented experimentation at the state level too, um, uh, in, in some cases led by state government, in some cases led by multi-stakeholder groups that have come together, um, you know, through a desire to create reform in the state. Um, so I, I really, you know, have always thought that reforms in healthcare are sort of a delicate dance between the public and private sector. The mm-hmm. private sector tries something bold and experiments, it works. And then the, you know, Medicare adopts it or Medicare tries something, it works, you know, the, um, the private insurers follow. So, you know, I think, I think both affect each other. Um, but I don't think it's going to be dependent on a top-down approach for reforms to happen. So last question, the Medicare shared savings plan hasn't generated a lot of savings so far among participants. Do you foresee the program continuing to lag or do you think the additional time and one-sided payments will prove beneficial? <laughs> if I had a crystal ball, I could answer that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you know, I think I shared my opinion earlier, which is I think that eventually we need to move more and more towards shared risk. Um, and, uh, you know, how that particular program fares over time, I'm not sure, but certainly in the private sector, um, many of our members are pushing for health insurers to make sure that there's a path towards shared risk over time with their accountable care organizations. Excellent. Well, that concludes our questions that we have for this afternoon's webinar. Uh, Suzanne, thank you very much. As always, a a very informative and uh, spirited discussion on this very complicated subject. And I just, on behalf of, uh, all my colleagues, I'd like to thank you for your expertise uh, on this particular subject. Oh, you know, I love the questions. They're great, and I'm happy to answer others um, between webinars if they come up for people. Absolutely, and I, I think just to, uh, so everyone can, who's on the, on the webinar right now can note it in their calendars, our next webinar, our fourth in a series of ten, uh, will be on Thursday, May 28th, and it's on value-based insurance design. So that would conclude our webinar for this afternoon. On behalf of the uh, NEHU Education Foundation and uh, the Catalyst for Payment Reform uh, and the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, thank you very much for tuning in. Look forward to uh, uh, talking with you again in a month or so. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Ms. Delbanco and Mr. Ganya. We also thank Janet Troutwine has left the conference. We also thank each of you for participating in today's program. This concludes Webinar 3, Payment Reform 101, with Suzanne Delbanco and Mark Gagne, presented by the National Association of Health Underwriters Education Foundation. Thank you again for attending. Have a great day, and you may now disconnect.